Jupiter has a little moon called Ganymede. Ganymede has a strong magnetic field. When it was discovered this, about this strong magnetic field, they said, wow, that's strange. That indicates a hot core, and yet Ganymede should have cooled off billions of years ago. I wonder why it still has such a strong magnetic field. Well, I can tell them why. You see, about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. Ganymede's not even 6,000 years old yet. Well, a few days older than that. It's real simple. Saturn has rings around it, but the rings are unstable and they're, they're, they're moving away from the planet. There are all kinds of factors that are affecting the rings of Saturn. Gravitational poles and things like that. There's a good article about it in the book uh, by Walt Brown in the beginning. Saturn's rings cannot be billions of years old. That fits the biblical theory that everything was created about 6,000 years ago. Okay, the moon is going around the Earth. How many knew that already? The moon goes around the Earth. Okay. Did you know, as the moon goes around, it's gradually getting farther away. We're slowly losing the moon. It's only a couple inches a year, about three inches a year, so it's no big deal. Nothing to worry about. Plus, there's nothing you could do about it anyway. Okay. <laughs> but the moon is getting farther from the Earth every year. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The moon is getting farther from the Earth every year. So that means that it used to be closer. How many can figure this out? Now stay with me, okay? All right. Well, if you bring the moon in closer, you start to create a problem because the moon causes the tides. Now, you folks in Jacksonville probably have to worry about the tides, don't you? If a hurricane hits during high tide, you've got a serious problem on your hand. Well, if you brought the moon in closer, the tides would be higher because of a law known as the inverse square law. If you brought the moon in to one-third the distance, you take the one-third, inverse it, and square it, it's nine times the gravitational pull. And if you run all the math on this, you'll find out about 1.2 billion years ago, the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the earth. Now, way before that, you're going to have a serious tide problem. <laughs> so that explains what happened to the tall dinosaurs. <laughs> they got moon. Comets are flying around through space, but comets are constantly losing material. That's what the tail is blowing off of a comet. It's losing part of itself, okay? You can't just keep losing and losing. Pretty soon, it's gone. You know, it's kind of like your checkbook. See, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall every single time. Well, these comets are losing material, and it's been estimated they can't last more than about 10,000 years. Okay, well, then I have a question. If the Earth is billions of years old, and if the universe is billions of years old, why do we still have comets? I mentioned this in a seminar one time, that this is an evidence that the universe is not billions of years old. Just the very existence of comets, like Halley's Comet, it proves it's not billions of years old. And this one atheist went home and devoted an entire website against me. There are now over 1,000 anti-Hovind websites. <laughs> Type in Kent Hovind on the search engine and watch your computer melt. <laughs> they hate me out there. So we spent about two months here uh, last year, and we developed a series called Dr. Hovind Answers His Critics. And we answer all the stuff that they say on the websites on a video. You can get on video or DVD or audio track if you'd like, or CD if you want to listen to it as you drive. I give an answer to some of the stuff they're, they're criticizing on there. But one of these atheists on his website, but, or you can also listen into my radio program. Go to Dr. Dino, my website, and go to the Creation Science Hour. We do a daily radio broadcast for an hour. Anybody calls, anyone, anybody from all over the world can call, and we get them from all over, and they ask questions. We have atheists call in and get angry and stuff like that. So that's what it's for. I want to be accessible, be able to answer questions, because I'm going to defend the Bible view against all comers. Anyway, the skeptic on his website said, Hoven, don't you know that a Dutch astronomer named Jan Ort proposed, that means he hoped, he wished, he prayed, that there was a shell of comets out there at the remote frontiers of the solar system. He said the reason we still have comets is because new ones keep coming in from the Oort cloud. Hmm. That's his theory, okay? He said, this Oort cloud is 50,000 astronomical units away. Well, for those that don't know what an astronomical unit is, that is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That is one astronomical unit, 93 million miles. Did you know it's pretty hard to see Pluto without an excellent telescope? And Pluto is only 39 astronomical units away. You certainly could not see a comet 50,000 astronomical units away. You see, nobody has ever seen the Oort cloud. Oort never saw the Oort cloud. <laughs> the whole thing's based on a mathematical mistake. There is no Oort cloud. We got even guys like Carl Pagan, a Sagan, who said, 
He said, many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there's not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. <laughs> they, they know all about it, except they've never seen it and know anything about it. There is no Oort cloud. But this skeptic, Matt Madsen, on his website said, fellas, if you want to use the comet argument, it's up to you to prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the Oort cloud and other sources don't exist. He's saying, I've got to prove the Oort cloud doesn't exist. <laughs> now, just hold on a minute, Dave. That's not the way science works. What he's trying to do here is called shifting the burden of proof. The liberals are really good at doing that, and we fall for it most of the time. I'll show you how easy it is to shift the burden of proof. Suppose I said, watermelons are blue on the inside until you cut the skin. Prove I'm wrong. <laughs> That'd be tough to do, wouldn't it? See, if all I have to do is make up a story and you've got to prove it's wrong, I can keep you busy the rest of your life. And he's trying to make up a story that there's an Oort cloud and saying, I have to prove it doesn't exist. How on earth would you prove the non-existence of anything? <laughs> Wouldn't you have to be all places at all times to prove anything doesn't exist? They, could, they can't find Osama bin Laden. Does that prove he doesn't exist? <laughs> uh, duh. <laughs> the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Everything in the universe tells us God designed it. You know, the evolution theory has the sun and stars evolving before the earth. The Bible says he made the earth before the sun and stars. Very clearly different. Actually, there are many differences. Between the evolution theory and the creation theory, everything is backwards. It's opposite. And we got these Christians trying to blend the two together. I say, duh, you guys, your Bible says exactly the opposite of what the evolution theory says. You know... The Bible has the fish coming before the insects. Evolution has insects evolving before fish. The Bible has plants coming before the sun was made. Evolution has the sun coming and then the plants. Most important difference, number 11, the Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. Total opposite, folks. Somebody's wrong. There is no compromise in this battle. Somebody's wrong. People say, couldn't God use evolution to create? Well, it's not the God of the Bible. The God that would need to use an evolutionary process is cruel and wasteful and retarded. <laughs> it's not the God the Bible teaches about. I wouldn't worship a God like that. Doesn't he know what he wants? Can't he just make it right in six days? Poof! Or six seconds. Why does your God have to practice and play around? You ought to trade your God in for a real one. But I, okay. The psalmist said, when I consider thy heavens. Hey kids, he says when, not if. You would do yourself a favor to shut off that TV once in a while and go outside and consider what God has made. The psalmist said, while I was musing, the fire burned. The word muse is used twice in the Bible. It means to think. Think. Now, English is a pretty cool language. A theist is a person who believes in God. If you put the letter A in front of a word, it means the opposite of. So an atheist is a person who claims he does not believe in God. Okay? Muse means to think. Ah, muse literally means to not think. That is the meaning of the word. They've got entire parks where you can actually pay money and go do that. They're called amusement parks. That's exactly correct. Okay. The psalmist said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, it's interesting. A person that spends his time considering what God has done is not impressed with what man can do. And parents, some of you ought to go home and look in your kid's bedroom. And if what you see plastered all over the wall are pictures of sports heroes, think carefully now. You're training your kids to meditate on what man can do. They're not meditating on what God has done. And you're going to raise a very shallow thinker in your house. The depth of his understanding is going to be, wow, he threw the ball through the hoop. Oh, and who is going to care in 40 years? Who's going to care in five years? Does anybody know who won the stupid bowl? I mean, the Super Bowl uh, 10 years ago? Anybody know who won 10 years ago? Does anybody care? It doesn't matter, does it? All those grown men out there fighting over that one ball, and they can all afford to go buy their own. I don't think it's sinful. I think it's just stupid to pay a guy $5 million to carry a pig bladder down a cow pasture. I don't think there's any common sense to that at all, okay? 